to Ruth chapter 4. This is the 12th message, I believe, that we preached in the book of Luke, or excuse me, Ruth. And um, let me just give you a few words that will help remind you and, and uh, bring back uh, some previous thoughts and messages. They started out in Bethlehem, which really is not as told in the story, but we know they go from Bethlehem because of a famine, and they go over into the country of Moab. Moab was a, uh, an enemy of God. Moab was an idol-worshiping people. But they went there because there evidently was food there, and then they come back to Bethlehem. And then Ruth goes out to work in the field. She meets Boaz. She meets him again at the threshing floor. And tonight we're going to find out that he goes to the gate. And uh, then they go to the wedding altar. And then they go to the birthing room. And then to King David. Uh, she is the great-great-grandmother uh, of King David. And uh, we find out that that's what you... Listen, you think about that journey. Bethlehem, Moab, back to Bethlehem then out in the field working, meeting the right person at the right time, and then Boaz takes interest, she takes interest, and now they're going to go to the gate where they seal uh, Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. And so uh, that will be the message tonight. We're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the kinsman redeemer. We have mentioned that several times, and that's all about uh, the book, and that is the, the book is an illustration of the love not only that Christ has for us as God's people, uh, but the relationship that he wants to enter into and then through us birth people into the family of God. Now, uh, so we've spoken about it, but we'll get into a little bit more detail tonight. So keep with me your Bibles. It may be on the, on the screens up front here. But look at Leviticus chapter 25. I want to go there. But let me read some verses out of Ruth chapter 4, first of all. And it says the word, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I need to turn a page here. Ruth chapter 4. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. And to whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. You remember the gate of a city in those days was like the courthouse. They went there to uh, transact any kind of legal business if they were selling or buying property. And this is basically what's taking place here. Verse 2 goes on to say, He then took ten men of the elders of the city, that would be like the city council, and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, it doesn't give his name, he is a kinsman of Naomi. And said, Naomi that has come out of the country of Moab selleth a parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. In other words, do it and they'll witness this. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. So Boaz is saying, you got first choice. you got the choice. You want this piece of property, or do you want to pass it on? And if you pass it on, I will take it. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, now he's going to get to the part. He said, There's a, there is a condition on this. If you take the land, you got to take a woman. <laughs> if you take the land, you got to, you get a wife with it. And he said, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead. Her husband, of course, was uh, passed away, one of the boys there in Moab, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And let me just stop and say this. In, in the Old Testament, and you're talking about a Jewish people. You know how they came out of Egypt across the Red Sea through the wilderness and came into Canaan, which is the land of promise. And once Joshua had basically conquered the land, um, they divided the land according to the 12 tribes. Now that was the most important thing. I mean, when they looked at that piece of property that Joshua had divided to their family, Judah, Benjamin, 
Issachar, Zebulun, going down the line, the 12 sons of Jacob. That was their inheritance from God. It was a gift from God. And so there was great emphasis on preserving that property in the name of that person or that tribe. And so they didn't sell the property outright to somebody outside the family or outside that tribe. They kept it in the family. Now notice in verse 6, And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself. So basically this man says, uh, I really don't want to take on the property, and I'm not going to take on the wife. And he said, uh, for I cannot redeem it. Maybe he didn't have the money to redeem it, but for whatever reason, that's what his conclusion was and his decision. Verse 7 says, Now this was the uh, manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things. A man, here's what they're going to do. A man plucked off his shoe, gave it to his neighbor. So the kinsman, the closer kinsman, took his shoe off and gave it to Boaz. That was just a symbol that he was submitting um, his right to become uh, the property owner. And he said in verse 8, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, buy it for yourself. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, that was Naomi's husband, and all that was Kalion's and Malon's, the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, may, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the inheritance of the dead upon his, or, or the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were there in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and Leah, which two did build the house of Israel. That was the two wives of Jacob who gave birth to the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve sons. And do thou worthily in Ephratah and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Now, I'm going to go over, let's go over to Leviticus chapter number 25. And we're going to look at verses 25 through verse 28. So in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 25. And I'm going to mention about three or four things tonight that this kinsman redeemer or the, the redeemer could purchase what he, could, what he had access to. And the first thing we see, uh, we see in this scripture is that had he had redemption, he was redeemed from poverty. Notice in verse 25 of Leviticus 25, If thy brother be waxen poor, and has sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So again, trying to keep it in the family. And if the man have none to redeem it, so there are none in the family says, I don't have the money either, uh, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. So he could, in a sense, sell this piece of property. But years later, he also had the right that if he got the money, he could purchase the property back. Again, the emphasis, so much emphasis on keeping it in the family because that was God's gift to his family. Verse 28 says, If he be not able to restore it to himself, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the, in the Jubilee it shall go out and he shall return unto his possession. Now, the year of Jubilee came every 50 years. 
So every 50 years, there was a lot of things that took place in the year of Jubilee. And one of these was that if you had to, because it was waxing poor, uh, you could, uh, uh, in the year of Jubilee, the property was restored to you. Okay? So, you know, if you had, let's say the year of Jubilee is 45 years away. <laughs> You're going to wait a long time and you might die but his family could come back and possess the property. And uh, so notice this, that this man becomes poor. He loses his possessions. He has this piece of property, and uh, his near kinsman was to redeem it for him, but he could not. And then the property, of course, remained in the possession of the one who held, we would say, who held the mortgage or the property. Now let me give you the, the picture of this. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he waxed spiritually poor. He had a great uh, relationship with God. God and Adam walking together in the garden in the cool of the day. And the Bible says that when he sinned, uh, that he lost that relationship with God. He went and hid himself because he knew that he was guilty of breaking the commandment of God. And so he lost his standing. Now, in a spiritual sense, he is poor. He is lost, as I was and as you was at one time, without God, without hope. This was the law for the poor. Adam could not redeem himself, but a lamb was shed, and he was clothed in the skins thereof. And the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so he had to wait until Jesus came, until another kinsman would come and redeem him and restore him to his prior standing with God. And that's what happened when you got saved and I got saved. That's why we say that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. We had lost our possessions. We had lost our spiritual riches. But when five Christ finally came and died on the cross, He alone was able to pay for our sins, my sins, your sins. And that's the only way that we can be saved. That's why the Bible tells us that we're not saved by works. Works could not bring back what we lost in the garden. Uh, good works and living a good life and being a good person could never purchase your redemption once you were lost you're lost and so somebody that we just sang about shed the blood uh, I thank God for the blood of Christ today that says uh, that that dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain that found the blood in his day and there may I the vile as he wash all my sins away Thank God for the blood of Calvary. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says this, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, He became human, and He became poor. You remember when the disciples wanted to follow Him, a man said, I want to follow you. And He said, Well, the birds of the air had their nests, the foxes had their holes, but I don't even have a home to live in. Are you willing to live that way? And so He became poor. Here's why. That ye through His poverty might be made rich. So Jesus became our kinsman redeemer. That's why the Bible says he became the God-man. He was fully God. He was fully man. The Bible says he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. He took upon him the form and likeness of man, yet without sin. But he came and became our kinsman redeemer. In the flesh, the Bible says, he was tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. And so we find there's a little chorus. So we need to learn this chorus. It says, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And that's what happened on Calvary. What the Bible, what does the Bible say about the poor? Well, in the, in the context of the Old Testament, it's talking about physically poor uh, and, in, in wealth and other things, being a poor, uh, poverty-stricken person. But when you come to the New Testament, the emphasis is on our spiritual poverty. Not on our, our physical or financial poverty, but our spiritual poverty. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. doesn't matter how much you have. 
doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or you're a pauper or you're a homeless person on the street. If you are poor in spirit, if you are humble and uh, you realize that you're a sinner and you're lost, it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or whatever. He said, those people, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's why the Bible says a man must come and humble himself before God so that he can be saved. When Jesus stood in the synagogue one day in Luke 4, 18, he stood there and he preached and one of the things he said was this, He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Poor, yes, financially, but poor spiritually. Luke 6, 20, lifted up His eyes upon His disciples, said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. In Luke 14, 21, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, And he said, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. That's people that Jesus is interested in. He's interested in poor people just as much as interested in the rich person. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or a miser or poor as you can be. The Bible said Jesus cared. Jesus died for everybody. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. I know that thou, uh, and thou knowest, Not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. When we get to Revelation, he's saying to a church, a church that's full of lost people. Just because folks go to church don't mean they're saved. And he said, you know not, you haven't recognized this fact that you're wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked before God. But I'll tell you what, Jesus still loved the poor. And He came to redeem us from spiritual poverty. It is the poor who can be saved. Never be saved until you see yourself uh, spiritually poor, a spiritual pauper, spiritually destitute, spiritually bankrupt, unable to purchase your own salvation. And then you will look for that kinsman redeemer who is willing and able to save you and forgive you. But until a person can say to themselves and say it honestly, I am a sinner. And I need to be saved. I need a kinsman redeemer. I need somebody who can touch God and who can reach down and touch me and pull us together. That's what the kinsman did. That's what the redeemer did. And Jesus is our redeemer. He is able, the Bible says. The Bible talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Talks about the riches of his grace. It talks about the fact that he is rich in mercy. It speaks of the riches of his glory. He is able to save to the uttermost, the Bible says, all that come to him by faith. Jesus is willing. Jesus said, I laid down my life. Now we say, well, the people crucified him, the Romans crucified him, the Jews crucified him. Big argument over. No, Jesus said, Nobody crucified me. I laid down my life. And he said, I will take it up again on the third day. He willingly became our kinsman redeemer. He didn't have to be bribed. He didn't have to be uh, paid off. He didn't have to have any other uh, motives except this, that he loved us for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, died in our place. And those who are poor can still be rich in faith and rich in the Lord. James 2.5 says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? You see, Adam lost that possession. He was evicted from the garden. He was banished from paradise. He was sold, as it were, into the hands of a stranger, Satan, who is now the God of this world. And creation is still groaning under the hand of Satan and this taskmaster. But one day Jesus came and He will come again and He will purchase this and there will be a lifting of the curse and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and we shall be fully redeemed in body, soul, and spirit all because Jesus came to deliver us and redeem us from poverty. Doesn't mean when you get saved you get rich. It didn't happen to me. (laughs) But I did get spiritually rich. Riches in Christ. Now go to Leviticus chapter 25. 
and we're going to begin reading in verse number 47. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 47. Go over to verse 47. It says, If a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, that is, he lives beside thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and selleth himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, that is, another uh, somebody else who's in this stranger's family. So, so far, here's what we got. We got a, a, a rich man, and we got a poor man. And this poor Jew is going to have to sell himself as a slave. He owes so much money, he's going to have to sell himself into slavery to purchase or to be able to keep his, his possession, but it ultimately become him. So, here is one, uh, one so poor that he has no property, nor possession, and he sells himself into slavery. Verse number 48, And after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son, that would be a nephew, may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin, a kinsman, unto him of his family may redeem him, and if he be able, he may redeem himself. So if while he is sold into this slavery, he earns enough money, he can pay his way out of slavery. Or, he said, one of his kinsmen can come and say, I want to purchase my family member, my uncle, my nephew, or whoever it might be, my brother, it could be anybody, and uh, he's a kinsman, and I want to pay his, his, his mortgage, his, um, his, his bondage fee, and I want to buy and put him back in to his property. So this again is what Adam did in the garden. He sold himself. The Bible says we are carnal. We are sold under sin. And he that sinneth is the servant of sin. When we are sinners, the Bible says we're servants of sin. Uh, you cannot quit sinning. You cannot, no matter how much power you have, no matter how wisdom you have, no matter how discipline you have, or self-will that you have, you cannot quit sinning. Men are slaves to sin, not willing to admit it. The Jews in John 8, 33, they said to Jesus, we're never in bondage to any man. Well, man, they had been in bondage to Egypt and uh, Babylon and Assyria and other nations. They had been in bondage all their life. Because of their idolatry, God let them go into bondage. But thank God, here's what happened. Jesus went to the gate. And he reckoned with the stranger, man who had purchased us in a sense, Satan, whom I had sold myself. He paid the debt. He set me free. There's cause of rejoicing. I'm talking about redemption involves and includes being set free from the bondage of sin. Just like this man was purchased out of slavery, he was redeemed from the bondage of sin. When I got saved, people get saved. They'll quit. They're cussing and they're smoking and they're drinking and they're lying and they're cheating and all those kind of things. That's because of who they are. But when Jesus moves in, he redeems redeems them from the bondage of sin. The Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you. In Psalm 49, verse 6, it says this, They that trust in wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. I'm, I'm a man. I'm, I'm a wealthy man. Look how much money I've got. Listen, here's what he said. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. You can't buy yourself. You can't buy your brother. You can't save anybody else. He said in verse 8, the next verse says, For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. So we're, we're not only redeemed from, from poverty. We're redeemed from bondage. God sets the prisoner free. There's all kinds of songs 
that talks about this. Jesus set the prisoner free. We're not sinless. We still can sin, but it doesn't have dominion over us like it did before we got saved and born again. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse number 5. Another example, and this is a redemption for the dead. This is what Ruth and Naomi are into. Naomi's husband had died. Ruth's husband has died. No heirs except this kinsman that he met at the gate. And then there was Boaz. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, 25 and verse number 5, If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. You couldn't, you couldn't marry somebody outside the family. The wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. See, we're talking, that emphasis comes back on, on family, keeping it in the family name. He said that his name not be put out. So if, if Naomi and, and Ruth had not went to the kinsman redeemer, then Elimelech, his name would have been put out under his two sons are dead. He has no heirs. And he would have lost, eventually lost that property. Naomi would have lost the property. That's why you said you got to buy the property and you got to buy the wife that goes with it. Verse 7, if the man like not to take his brother's wife, you know, he says, I don't want her. <laughs> you want to marry your uh, sister-in-law? <laughs> if the man... Like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up, listen to this, to the gate of the elders and say, so she's coming to the same gate. My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him, and if he stand to it, that is if he agrees, that's what he don't, he don't want to marry her, and say, I like not to take her. I don't want her. Then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. <laughs> you wouldn't get away with that today, would you? And shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that has his shoe loosed. So she does the same thing, only this time it adds a little feature to it. She spits in his face. Why? Because you have, you have denied your responsibility to keep this thing in the family. It was a shame. It was a disgrace not to take his brother's wife, marry her, raise up children so his brother's name would remain in the people of Israel. So there is redemption for the dead. Her husband has died. Naomi's husband has died. Ruth's husband has died. This was the case of Ruth. It is a law to preserve the name of the dead, to carry on his inheritance in Israel. Listen, one day the Bible says, I was dead in my sins. There was no hope of living on forever and ever. But now Jesus came and He not only saved me, the Bible said, He raised me from the dead and I have eternal life. And uh, But not without cost. It cost Jesus. But He paid the death pledge. He was my kinsman redeemer. He did not refuse to take me. He said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you died before the debt is paid, it remained in the hands of the one who bought it, holds the mortgage. Adam mortgaged the universe. Let's go back to Adam. That's when sin started. That's when this whole thing began. And uh, Adam, uh, the, you know, there's a death pledge that fell upon the human race. And uh, it was mortgaged to a stranger, which was Satan. 
But our kinsman redeemer showed up at the gate of Calvary and he called this stranger by name. He said, the prince of this world is judge and he paid off the mortgage and it is finished and he loosed the shoe from off the devil and spit in his face and then claimed his bride, which is you and I. Man, what a savior. What a kinsman redeemer we have. Now you know sometimes when people are evicted, maybe for not paying the mortgage or not paying their rent. I've had to do that with Matt, had that property in South Carolina. We had about three different renters that just wouldn't pay, and we finally had to get her evicted. She wouldn't leave. So what you do is you get an eviction notice. She has 30 days to move out. If she doesn't, then you got to call a sheriff, and he'll forcefully remove uh, the violator from the home. And one day, the high sheriff of heaven came and he took the devil, cast him into the bottomless pit, and then he'll restore the earth to its former glory and bring back, as it were, the garden of evil and paradise, a new heaven and a new earth. And so there is redemption from poverty. There is redemption from bondage. There is redemption for the dead. We were spiritually dead. I like that song. It says, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee my Savior and my God. Let me ask you a question. Have you been to the gate? Have you ever seen yourself as a poor, lost sinner on your way to hell? You're in bondage. You're without hope, unable to save yourself. You cannot redeem yourself. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away sin. Have you ever come to our kinsman and David, not Boaz, but our Savior, and laid down at His feet and then met Him at Calvary's hill and said, I need to be redeemed. I need to be saved. I need to be a child of God. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Lord, save me and trust Him to do it. And He came and He willingly is our kinsman redeemer and He's able, He's the only one able to redeem us from sin. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please.